doing so much depending on the oil price. Uh, when the oil price is, is going up, Russia's economy is doing very well, maybe growing even in the area of 7, 8, 9 percent. When the oil price is down, it's uh, suddenly and immediately uh, a minus close. So uh, Russia has to balance it, and Russia has to uh, find new um, governance structures, uh, a bit uh, adopting the Western model, we talked about it before, and uh, going for better global governance. When you look from the outside world, uh, you feel that um, FDI, foreign direct investment in Russia, could be much, much better. It's a um, lack of trust in the Russian uh, rule of law. Many foreign direct investors go to China, go to Indonesia, go to other countries. But Russia is such a wealthy country, such a uh, highly educated country, and it deserves much more uh, FDI. I think uh, Russia should uh, actively attract FDI and uh, work on those investment conditions. And know that, for example, um, uh, uh, Vice Prime Minister Shuvalov is working with it and uh, is going even like on investor tours around the world, meeting uh, large um, companies and, and trying to convince them to invest into Russia. And we see some first results, some automotive um, companies now setting up operations in Russia. The pharmaceutical sector is very strong in Russia. Uh, what Russia has to do now is to develop also its own brands. There are not many Russian brands, maybe beside uh, the vodka, uh, beside um, uh, some other areas from the Soviet period. Uh, but there are some players like um, Kaspersky Software. Kaspersky Software uh, is one of the uh, most famous software in the antivirus area. It's of Russian origin and uh, it's a global brand. And I think Russia needs much more, many more brands uh, like that Kaspersky in the future. Um, Frank, you've built a, a truly unique platform with Horasis. Um, how can global business leaders become involved with your organization? Horasis is a very open organization, so we invite um, CEOs of large companies, but also CEOs of um, smaller companies, startup companies. We don't have really um, uh, um, the bottom line or like. Um, um, uh, the, the line saying you have to have at least four to five to ten billion turnover. We invite everybody uh, who is interesting and interested uh, in what we do and uh, the most important thing is to contribute to the discussions and to our projects. We very much focus on China, India, Russia, the Middle East, but we are also planning activities focusing on Latin America and on Africa in the future. So we are really the I think maybe the only platform in the world, um, all encompassing emerging markets, uh, trying to help them to grow into um, uh, true global multinationals, but also helping multinationals to invest in those countries. I mentioned Russia before, trying to work on the um, uh, uh, investment climate uh, in a country like Russia. I think we can do it uh, because we are independent, we are Swiss based, we are not working on behalf of a government. Still. We have a very benign approach. We work together with governments and trying to join hands uh, to improve investment conditions. So uh, very much, um, I would say, welcome uh, to CEOs from emerging countries, uh, from Europe, from North America as well. And we would really like uh, to create the new platform for dialogue and for business. As you as mentioned earlier, there are really five major events. Uh, you do the annual meeting in Zurich, the um, Russia business meeting, the global India business meeting, the global China business meeting, and the global Arab business meeting. Um, where should business leaders go to actually contact you and become involved with those events? Well, we got uh, our website, verasis.org. Uh, all the information is on the website. Uh, what is uh, really happening now, we are not doing advertising. We are not uh, promoting um, uh, the meetings in a big way, uh, what's happening now is really um, the power of the word of mouth. People are talking about it and people usually um, uh, get in other friends, CEOs uh, involved in these meetings. So the meetings are growing every year. We have uh, three to four hundred uh, participants and the meetings are always hosted outside the country in focus. So the China meeting uh, was hosted in Valencia in Spain last year. This year will be held in Riga in Latvia. We're always going for unusual uh, places. You know, Chinese CEOs usually are not going to Latvia, but uh, this is a very fact why it's so interesting for them to go, discovering no new business opportunities and uh, you know trying to um, find peers in those respective countries. 
the host governments like Latvia, like Spain, are very much involved in the process of setting up the meeting. Usually a prime minister or a minister is welcoming participants from China, India, Russia, or the Arab world. But it's not only a bilateral meeting, it's really a, a global meeting. We have participants from all around the world uh, joining us. I remember at our last um, China meeting in Spain, we got quite a good number of participants from Latin America, which is obvious because it was held in Spain, and from Africa. So many Africans flew into Valencia to meet Chinese CEOs. So we see really the true global nature of these meetings. And uh, we try um, to be uh, very, um, um, uh, in a way, um, heterogeneous because we want to have different actors attending. From China, we have both the state-owned sector and the private sector attending. And sometimes we feel that those Chinese companies meet for the first time at our meeting uh, because the state-owned players and the private players are totally different, it's a different world. But we combine them in one meeting uh, when we uh, gather uh, on an annual basis. So we would like to continue this model. And um, I think um, over the years, uh, the uh, meetings build a certain brand. In China, uh, many of the leading Chinese CEOs know about the meeting and uh, even knock on the door. So it's not that we have to push participants to come. On the contrary, they want to come and, uh, and join us. And we have to keep the meeting still small and intimate. If the meeting uh, is growing, it's getting bigger, I think you lose a bit the, the intimacy. And we think the size of three to 400 CEOs is just the right size where you can still meet, talk, and uh, become friends. And, and that's really what struck me, I think. Um, if events become too big, they become essentially photo opportunities, but the real hard work, it strikes <coughs> me, is getting done at events such as the Horasis meetings. And, uh, and so I'm very encouraged to see so many business leaders from around the world getting together and actually working on some of the hard problems that we're facing. I think it's really key and it's maybe um, uh, the key to uh, create this um, atmosphere of, uh, of friends, of peers who meet in a, in a way like uh, gathering around a fireplace atmosphere. Uh, we don't really uh, uh, script our sessions too much. We just put people into the room. It's very open and free winning uh, discussions. Of course, there are other big meetings around in the world. There's a big meeting happening here in the Swiss Alps every year. And I believe those meetings are just getting too big. And, uh, you know, uh, there are maybe 30 or 40 prime ministers coming in and they just go for the next big headline in the media. And uh, what we want to do really is, is to, um, to work and uh, to provide solutions uh, at the end of the day where everybody in the room can, can participate. So that's with the... Uh, our model and I think uh, we're on the right wing and the right avenue. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really endorse your mission and you. Uh, wish you continued success uh, with Horasis. Thanks so much, John. I appreciate it.